gun. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's liberty! It, it's her! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Why is mad? Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death! <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I do think it still is morning, right, Danny? I think so. The sun's coming out somewhere. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast number five. I'm Ernest Emerson, and I'm here with Danny T. to bring you today's conversation. And good day, Danny. Good day to you, Ernie. Today, uh, I'm going to start off a little bit talking about something that has been uh, important in my life and uh, something that I am very passionate about and uh, something that uh, I guess is what I would like to instill in in anyone that I had any influence with, uh, especially my family. Uh, And any of you that are out there listening that might uh, take a hanker into this, that would be that would be a good thing uh, on my end. So, and what am I going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about personal responsibility, and that, that's something that that I am, I guess uh, you'd say, a, a responsibility addict. And you know, I've I've learned that that was probably one of the most important uh, things that I had ever. Uh, changed about myself personally, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of uh, the story of that. Uh, and, I, and I guess what that had to do with was just a realization that I had about 35 or maybe even 40 years ago now. Uh, you know, I was working at a company called Hughes Aircraft, and I noticed that there were always people at work that always seemed to be having trouble in life. Uh, they were having trouble at work. They were having trouble with their marriages, with their wives, girlfriends. Uh, they were having trouble with, you know, personal business, uh, with, with banks, car loans, you know, all, all of those things. And I started looking at that stuff, and, and I thought, man, those, that sucks. You know, why are those guys having such a, such a hard go of things, you know? And uh, I didn't really have those same problems. You know, I, was, I guess I was already pretty squared away. Uh, and and by that, I mean, I, I always paid all my bills and I showed up to work on time and worked hard when I was on the job. Uh, so I, I just didn't have a lot of those problems. But, you know, there were still things that happened that uh, that I got myself into, if you will, and uh, didn't really, they weren't pleasant. Uh, but these things I saw, and the th- they were things that I thought, wow, you know, those people, are they're constantly blaming something else or other people or, or the, the system or whatever. Uh, rather than themselves for the problems that that they were having, and uh, looking at it from the outside, it, it was it was easy for me to to see that you know they were causing their own problems. Uh, you know there was a lot of complaining about getting screwed by the bank or the boss or you know what you can fill in the blank on that one, and uh, I just thought you know I don't know if that's always the case. And uh, here's just a small example of what I would what I had seen and the things I was looking at. Uh, this one guy 
he, he thought he was going to resell his car. So he went out and disconnected the speedometer cable. And uh, I guess he wanted to keep the, the mileage under the, the warranty yeah. uh, number of miles on it so he could you know, resell it with the warranty still in place. He thought that was going to be something that was worthwhile doing. And, uh, of course, you know, when you mess with a speedometer cable, there's some kind of seal or, or, or something or marker on it or something that, that uh, I guess, lets you know that if that, that speedometer has been tampered with. I think it's an official uh, Department of Transportation thing that has to go on the, on the speedometers. But they can tell, you know, if you've taken that speedometer apart or whatever. So he was going to, I think he was going to trade the car into a dealer and get a new car or whatever. And uh, lo and behold, the dealer, when they checked the car out, they said, no way, you, you, you messed with the speedometer. You, you turned it off or whatever. And, uh, you know, we're not, we're not going to deal with this. We're, we're not going to give you anywhere near what the car might be worth because you've done something to it, and we don't know how many miles are on it. And he, he got all bent out of shape, and he was going to fight him, and he tried taking him to court and all, all that kind of stuff. And it just went on and on and on. And in, in the end, he, he, you know, he didn't win, and uh, he took a big loss and, and all that stuff. And, you know, I looked, that, that was something that I'm just bringing up here because it's, it's kind of a, 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 a big thing, if you will, that I could really look at and kind of dissect. Uh, he brought on all his own troubles. He, he caused everything uh, bad uh, that happened uh, by his actions. And, of course, he, he hated the car company, and he hated the bank, and he hated the loan officer and all that because they, they somehow in, in a cosmic uh, conspiracy had uh, gotten together to, to punish him for something that he just couldn't understand. And uh, that, that, to me, was like the ultimate uh, shirking of responsibility, which is the opposite of where we're going to go with this. You know, but but that's just one small example, you know, of, of a person that was you know trying to work the system or, or whatever to get ahead. Uh, but at the at in doing so, they were causing all their own problems. And you know, then there, there was the other people that I'd see out there that they were always in trouble with their boss, uh, and they were always they always had to call in the union to help them out of a jam and all this kind of stuff. And even those things, they, they always came down to something that they had done and something that they had done wrong. Uh, you know, I looked at that, and I, I guess in a, in a moment of lucidity, if, if a 25-year-old can be lucid, uh, I felt, you know, wow, if those people can cause all the bad things to happen to them, you know, by doing the things that they're doing, what if you spent that much time trying to cause good things to happen to you? Would that work? And, you know, if you're, if you're in control of what's going on around you uh, and are, are able to construct all these bad things, what if you constructed everything so that you could make only good things happen to you and, and not any of the bad things? You know, and that, that had a lot to do with what I determined was came down to just one thing, personal responsibility. Uh, I, I took that to the extreme, and, and I convinced myself that, you know, I am responsible for every single thing that happens in my life, everything. You know, if I, if I step off the curb and a meteor strikes me on the head, that's still my responsibility. I, I'm the one who decided to step off the curb at that moment and put myself in that position. And, you know, again... I'm just using that to illustrate to the to the degree that I cemented this into my character, and uh, I'm not going to kid around on it. it. It was amazing because once I was able to fully realize that I control every single thing that happens to me, then I could. Uh, uh, and this this might sound exploitive on the surface, uh, but it's not. Uh, but then I could manipulate everything to work in my favor. And, and I don't say that from a nefarious standpoint or, or self-centered or, or selfish or anything. I'm just saying, hey, you know what? If I can make bad things happen real easy, uh, you know, isn't it just as easy to make good things happen? Uh, you know, that, that's where I went with it. So I, I took that stand, and, and lo and behold, uh, I'm not kidding again, uh, within a short period of time, and I mean, believe me, uh, you know, 
I, I wasn't a ne'er-do-well, and I wasn't a dishonest, evil bastard, if you will. So, you know, maybe I didn't have to start from the ground level, but, you know, I noticed a big difference in everything that I did. And it opened up the doors. Uh, it opened up positions at work. It opened up, you know, promotions for me. Uh, it opened up better relationships with my wife. And uh, uh, eventually, I, I believe it, it helped me become a better father uh, just as a result of, of taking that responsibility that role of responsibility. Now, there's a little more to it than, than what I might have just described. Uh, you know, it, it's a job. It, it's something you have to do, a task. Uh, the, the thing that you have to do, um, you know, in order to start this ball in motion about personal responsibility is you have to be really uh, willing to, to look yourself in the eye uh, with all your warts and scars and, and not be scared of it. And I mean, it's a discomfort level at first to look at yourself and say, hey, uh, you know, what's, what's wrong with me? What's bad about me? Uh, what things can I improve? Uh, what are the things that I should eliminate from my life? Uh, you know, as much as I might even like doing those things, <laughs> you know, what are the things that, uh, that, that are holding me back? And uh, what are the things that I'm doing wrong, just flat wrong? That are, that are causing me my problems, if you will. And it, it came down to, um, that, that was a tough thing. That, that, that wasn't easy uh, because I don't think anybody, uh, you know, really knows themselves. And, you know, at least most people don't. You know, they kind of drift along and uh, in cruise uh, control or automatic drive, whatever you want to call it. And uh, they just... They just keep trying to get to their destination. Some of them don't even know what the destination is, but uh, they're certainly not in control of it. And, and I don't think uh, a lot of people really truly understand uh, not just who you are, but also why you are. You know, why do you do these things? Uh, because that's part of the whole package. You, you not only have to be able to identify the things that you want to eliminate or improve, uh, but you've got to understand why do you do those things? And why is a, is a big question. You know, what motivates you to have that mode of behavior, good or bad? And, and one of the other things that, that's integral to this, uh, this path, if you want to call it that, uh, that's, that's actually a pretty good description to get on this path, the path to ultimate responsibility, uh, is that you have to be honest. And I mean brutally honest. You have to be able to basically you know, be able to step outside of yourself and, and look at yourself like your worst critic. And I mean to look at yourself like, like you would hate the person that you're describing because that's the only way you're going to be able to, to really uncover the facade uh, that most people have about who they are. Uh, I'm good at this. I'm good at that. I'm blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know? You know those things. Uh, what are you bad at? You know, what are your deficits? It's, it's, a, it's something that most people uh, never want to face. They don't want to know those things about themselves. And generally, the people that do point those things out to you, uh, well, most of the time, they're, they're not going to be your best friend. Uh, when someone says, hey, you're an a-hole or, you know, you're a jerk or whatever, it's usually in a... In a uh, a negative or disparaging light, and uh, you don't want to hear that, even though that m person might be, you know, telling you something that's true. Uh, I remember David Goggins said one time, he goes, look, uh, if somebody says you're fat, well, guess what? You might be fat. And uh, it's that same kind of thing. You know, when you hear it from other people, uh, you usually put up a fight against it or, or react back to it or, or don't want to hear it or whatever. So, you know, it, it bothers you. It's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to be criticized. And, uh, you know, if you're lucky, you might have a relationship with somebody, your best friend, your wife, uh, that, that, you know, maybe they can be honest with you. Uh, that's, that's a pretty, pretty uh, rare thing. Uh, most people uh, kind of hide behind uh, a lot of... Uh, Smoke and mirrors. Do I, do I look fat in this dress? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, that reminds me of that commercial with Abraham Lincoln when uh, Martha Lincoln asked him, uh, 
uh, do I look fast in this dress? And here, honest Abe, never tell a lie, right? <laughs> he kind of he kind of hesitated for a moment. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'll tell you, one of the worst myths that that you know people carry about themselves is you know when you do say, "Hey, be honest with me. Tell me the truth." Uh, you know, even though most people will say that from time to time, they still don't want to hear the truth. Uh, they want to hear the pat on the back. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to ask you a question they, they might even already know the answer, you know, uh, to. In, in other words, uh, you know, people who do something real good and they'll say, hey, be honest with me, tell me what you like about it. And they know it's a, it's a good project or a good job. They, they, they set you up to, so that, you know, uh, they know you're going to say, hey, that, well done. You know, that was a good effort. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's human nature. We, we want to be, uh, we want to get that reward, that treat, just like a dog. And, uh, you know, but most people, when they ask that question, they, they really don't want to hear the truth. And, uh, you know, okay, that's not so bad. You're, you're doing a good job at this, you know. Uh, those are the things that, that and again, I, I'm guilty of it too, and I'm guilty of it on both ends. Uh, depends on the person that uh, asks me that question. Uh, and uh, I, I don't, if my wife asks me if, if, if she thinks that dress looks good on her or not, uh, I got to hesitate for a moment because <laughs> <laughs> I got to figure out what answer I want to give. Uh, but uh, no, she's pretty. Actually, my wife's pretty brutally honest. At least she is with me, and uh, you know that's a good thing because that's that's part of where I'm where I'm going with this. So, you know. But the thing is, is if I ask somebody, you know, tell me the truth: is this good or is this bad? Uh, What's wrong with hearing the truth? Because, you know, why would you want to continue on and not realize that you could improve, that you could do better, that you could realize your full potential? Uh, why would you want to continue on doing something that might be causing uh, you harm or screwing up a relationship, uh, uh, your, your relationship to, uh, to family, to friends, uh, to coworkers, uh, all of those things? Uh, you know, you need to be able to really look at that person in the mirror, uh, because we don't all, We most of us don't have those friends. And and honest, hearing it from somebody else sometimes that's a that's a splash of cold water. Uh, but you know, when I talk about personal responsibility and taking it, you know, all the way to the to the nth degree, uh, you have to be and become your own worst critic. And you know. You know all your secrets. You know everything about yourself. And as much as you may uh, 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 have that facade of, of who you are, uh, still underneath that facade, uh, you know the truth. And uh, so the only person who can really, really be honest with you is yourself. And, uh, but that's, that's a tough thing. You know, most people, uh, you know, they don't want to face that either. You know, so one of the things that I, that I suggest you do is... Uh, you sit down with a pencil and paper, two columns, good things about me, bad things about me. And if you're honest, I'll tell you right now, uh, if, you, well, let's say if you're just playing this as a game, you're going to have more good things than bad. Uh, if, if you're kind of honest, you might have 50% good things and 50% bad. But if you are really, truly honest with yourself, you might have four or five good things, and you might have a hundred things that are bad, because that's what it's going to take. Uh, you know, I mean, really, to undercover, uh, to uncover, um, you know, to peel back the onion, to get to the core, uh, you have to be that brutally honest. And I'll tell you, if you're a guy who who only has good things in the column, well, uh, then you're someone that's uh, really quite special, because uh, unless you were given a uh, virgin birth. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anybody else has ever had the only good things on that side of the column. So, uh, you know, that's not who you are. You know, so what it comes down to uh, is is being a, a, able to be honest, uh, and it, it has to be you know the worst kind of nightmare honesty that you can face because the things uh, is uh, those things that you have to improve on. They're simple, but in order to address them, you, you first got to be aware of them. You can't deny them. You can't live in denial. 
Uh, we all know the good things we do. We just don't want to hear the bad things. Uh, you, you know, we, we do that because we don't want to face them. And that is that discomfort zone that nobody likes going to. So, you know, once you've written those things down, uh, you can just start to work on them. And, and some of them are going to be simple. Some of them are going to be as easy as, hey, man, uh, be a little more patient with your wife. Uh, don't raise your voice to her. Really, actually listen to what she's saying. Uh, you know, it could start off with little things like that. And, you know, that 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 might even be tough to do for some people. Uh, you know, guilty as charged on that one, i, I got to tell you, Danny. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't want to. I played the fifth. <laughs> uh, you know, because, you know, most of who we are is a result of habits. And, you know, I've talked about habits a lot. And uh, as you know, a habit can, can either be a good habit or a bad habit. And and some of these things have been, you've been, uh, they've been locked up in you. Uh, you know, you've been doing them your your entire life, and it takes a while, but you you have to make that conscious effort, and that's the only way that you you can make these conscious efforts is to understand what you're doing. And uh, it's it's kind of like setting a, a goal, okay? And, and you, as you know, I'm I'm big on goals, and we've talked about this before. Uh, you set goals. Uh, and, and if your goal in this case is to improve yourself, you know, let's say to be the best person you can be, best father, best husband, best friend, uh, then you pick one of those goals and then you just say, look, what am I doing to support that? Uh, and then you have to be able to, to stop and uh, self-evaluate with that honesty I'm talking about and say, what am I doing that's getting in the way of that? You know, what do I need to do uh, to eliminate whatever it is that's holding me back from that goal? And some some of these things are, you know, you eliminate things that you might, like I said earlier, you might like doing. But, you know, uh, again, where, where are you going with this? You want to be honest? You want to improve? Uh, then that takes some sacrifice sometimes. And, uh, you know, that's that's important to, to, you know, to have these goals. And because, you know, you need that to be able to change those habits. And if, if I don't know that I have a bad habit, uh, if I think it's a good habit, but it's actually a bad habit, uh, I'm never going to change it. So, you know, again, that that's, comes down to that honesty. I mean, think about it. You know, it, it's, it's like when people have asked me, uh, you know, wh- what do I want my son to be? And I've thought long and hard about that. And, and I came up with, with one answer that, that, that answers that question every single time. I want my son to be the man that I would be happy that my daughter would marry. And as for my daughters, uh, you know, I would want them to be a, the woman that I would be happy that my son would marry. And I, I hope that doesn't sound weird. It makes sense to me. Uh, but, you know, the standards, in other words, uh, if, if my daughter came home with a, with a young man and, uh, you know, said that this was the one she wanted to marry, I, I would want him to be uh, the man that I want my son to be. In other words, he's, he's going to have to live up to the standards that I've set uh, for my own son. And uh, the same thing uh, for my son. He brings home a woman uh, that he has decided he wants to marry. Uh, I would want that to be uh, at the same standard uh, that I'd held for my daughters. So, uh, you know, that's the way I look at it. Uh, if, if I can produce uh, a result uh, in my family that, 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 that I'm happy with, then I know they're going to be happy with that, that person too. You want those people to be the best person uh, in all regards. And, uh, you know, it, it, it comes down to things that, uh, uh, you know, setting up these conscious efforts to improve in the areas you choose. Uh, you know, it, you look at it and you say, okay, you said there might be 100 things on my bad list. And it's tough for me to, to do 100 things all at once. But when you look at all those things that you might have on your list, uh, a lot of them would overlap. Uh, you know, let's say you wanted to, you decided you wanted to be a, a more kind or, or gentle person, whatever. Uh, well, that probably covers a lot of the other stuff that's, that's also on that list. It it'd probably cover the way that you act with your friends and, and the way that you, you act with your family. Uh, and, and things like that, you know. So a lot of that stuff is is going to kind of overarch and cover a lot of of those multiple uh, 
subjects on the bad list, if you will. And but that's all, you know, that part of taking responsibility because you can't take responsibility for what you do in your life. And I mean, 100 percent responsibility unless you really are honest with yourself. Uh, and in order to be honest with yourself, you have to be able to look objectively at yourself uh, like your own worst enemy, uh, if you will. And then you take that viewpoint and you make that the one that you're working on. Uh, your goal would be to have that person, the, the, the you who's going to be brutally honest, uh, the one who's going to tell you, hey, uh, when those things happen, you've really changed, man. You've really come around. You're now doing the right thing. Uh, that's something that only you can decide to do, and you have to work at it, but you can do it. Again, uh, about responsibility, uh, you know, by being responsible for everything that you do, one of the things that you won't do is you won't blame other people. And if you take that stance, uh, let's say that's the, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, that's probably the, one of the that one I, I almost can guarantee is going to be on almost everyone's list because we always look to externalize stuff and and when you're taking responsibility for for everything that happens to you 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 can't externalize anything uh you're you're going to have to own up to it you're going to, as jocko and, and and leif and those guys all say uh you have to own it uh that's you and uh you know if you take that stance uh when something goes wrong uh, if if you take responsibility for it, uh, you're going to find out something else. The people that you used to blame for everything, they didn't like that. No one likes to be blamed for things. And if you're not going to do that anymore, then all of a sudden, guess what happens? They're going to like you a whole lot better. Hey, Ernest is turning out to be a pretty nice guy. He's not a, such a big jerk anymore. He's now a better friend of mine. Uh, and, and they may not even know why, but they'll get that feeling because now you're taking the responsibility. You're not blaming other people and other things, which, which in the end makes you a, a lot more likable guy. And, and those, are, those are the kind of things that you're going to start to see uh, if, you, if you get on this path. And, and I'll tell you what, there's few things on earth that, that uh, makes you feel better than being someone who's well-liked by others. That, that's a huge positive reinforcement. Uh, and, I mean, you still have to have your convictions. You, you, you still have to have the things that you stand for uh, in spite of the fact that it, it may be unpleasant for, for others. But uh, if, you're, if you're doing the right thing, uh, people are going to recognize that, uh, and they're going to like that. They're going to look up to you. Uh, again, uh, that's just something I think we should all be aware of and... You know, I got to say, it's still a work in progress with me. Uh, I'm not done yet. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be done. But I do spend the, the time, and, and I do work on it as much as I can. And it, it's changed my life. And I'll tell you what, if you, if you just do some of the simple things that I've outlined uh, here today, uh, it'll change your life too. Uh, I can guarantee it. There is no downside to it. So give it your best shot. Well, folks, uh, you know, I've just talked about, you know, the, the role of personal responsibility, um, meaning personal uh, in your personal life and all that. And uh, now I'm going to go on to something that uh, I hope is of value to a lot of people, and that's the, uh, the role of responsibility and, and what you have to deal with uh, when you own a business. Now... A lot of people may not know this, but uh, the myself personally, uh, I've been heavily, heavily influenced uh, by my relationship with uh, members of the U.S. Navy SEAL teams uh, for over 35, probably going on 40 years now. And some of them have become some of my best friends, uh, guys that I know I could call in the middle of the night if something was going wrong and they'd be there no matter where they were in the world, basically. Um, and they were also a huge influence in what we did as a business. And, you know, I, I didn't uh, have a business degree. I didn't know anything about running a business. Uh, 
I just had something that I guess a lot of people were interested in in owning, and I was the guy who could create that stuff. So uh, that was about as far as I went, uh, knowing anything about business. But uh, let's just say this, and I've spoken uh, of this uh, in the past, there would not have been an Emerson Knives if it wasn't for uh, the U.S. Navy SEAL teams. And that all started one day uh, when I was a young, uh, up-and-coming uh, knife maker, custom knife maker. And uh, three guys showed up at my table at a local show here in Southern California and identified themselves as, uh, picture air quotes here, underwater welders. And uh, asked me if I could make them some special knives for, for their use uh, underwater and in other environments like that. And so I said, yeah. And, uh, you know, they knew that uh, I was a local guy, so to speak, so they could work with me uh, kind of on an ongoing basis. And anyway, one thing led to another, and uh, we developed a knife called the CQC6, which uh, became kind of a special knife. It's kind of an, it, it was one of the uh, most influential knives in the history of tactical knife making kind of set the stage for that whole uh, genre and everything. And the influence that they had on me from that specific moment forward has, has never waned and it's never gone away. And now we're into uh, many, many generations of uh, Navy SEALs uh, past those, those guys that uh, stepped up uh, to my table uh, who, who are still some of my best friends on the face of this earth. But it's funny because uh, we had a, uh, a vendor, Danny, and uh, he, he was doing some uh, tooling work for us, and he got interested in knives. And this is in, you know, 2016 or 2017, something like that. And he was working with one of our expediters, and one day, uh, you know, he had been going to a couple knife shows and got interested in it because he, he had an association with Emerson uh, and uh, just kind of picked it up and all of a sudden was, was gung-ho to buy all these custom knives and things from uh, custom knife makers and everything else. And he made a mention to uh, our guy, uh, whose name was Ken. He said, Ken, uh, d does Ernest Emerson really know any Navy SEALs or is that just a bunch of... Uh, marketing hype that he's used over the years and Ken was like are you kidding and, and proceeded to kind of fill him in on the stories and what Ken did is he came back to me and said Ernie there's something going on here that uh, you might not be aware of uh, your story uh, the story of this company the story of your relationship with the, the Navy uh, because we're now six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen, twenty generations of Navy SEALs down the road, uh, the public doesn't know that story because the people that knew it uh, in the beginning, thirty plus years ago or whatever, uh, are not the same people that are going to uh, purchase knives and things like that now. So a lot of the younger uh, generation of customers actually. Uh, they don't know that story. And I was like, wow, that's weird. But in retrospect, when I look at it, it it's because we never, um, you know, if this sounds a little crude, uh, we never hoard out our relationship with anybody, uh, whether it was the, you know, Army, uh, Special Forces or, or the Navy or, or anyone, the Marines. We never use that as a uh, an advertising platform. And the only reason people even knew about it was was word of mouth from either people that that knew us or from the guys that were on the teams and i'm just going to go through a, a tiny list here uh starting with what you know these people had uh, a role in 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 my life and uh, my family's life and also my business life and we started with those underwater welders and uh out of that uh came a guy that we'll just call him the mystery mentor at this point because I, I know that he's still heavily involved in a lot of things that uh, uh, 
he can't be mentioned publicly, let's say. And he became uh, what is commonly called a sea daddy to me. And uh, really, uh, we spent, you know, hundreds of hours uh, discussing things. Uh, I was learning from him. He was teaching me uh, all kinds of uh, uh, man skills, if you would, uh, in regard to uh, combat, warfare, etc. Uh, and also in a business uh realm because the principles uh, for survival and combat are just the same as the principles for the survival in business. I uh, just changed the uh, playing field. Still to this day is one of my, my dearest friends. Uh, introduced me to Dick Marcinko. Uh, again, a guy uh, who, I mean, he founded the uh, U.S. Navy SEAL Team Counterterrorist Unit, uh, SEAL Team 6 at that time. And uh, he became a, a huge influence in my life and spent many, many hours uh, discussing leadership and, and uh, all kinds of different diverse subjects, uh, including uh, drinking a little of that Bombay uh, blue sapphire uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that he loved so dearly. And, uh, you know, that, that led to uh, uh, a whole bunch of different things. Uh, then... Uh, he introduced me to a gentleman, uh, Chris Karachi, who was also a uh, SEAL, to, SEAL Team 6 uh, member, uh, which, you know, on another podcast or two, uh, we're going to have Chris on, actually, but uh, we'll talk about uh, the things that, that uh, Chris uh, was as an influence to me, uh, who introduced me then to Dennis Chalker, Denny. And Denny was the command master chief who ran the entire uh, – Navy SEAL BUDS training program for a number of years, and uh, Denny was also uh, one of Dick's uh, uh, progeny and was a plank owner of, of SEAL Team 6, and uh, just let's just say Denny's another real interesting guy, but we've, uh, we've shared a lot of uh, actual blood and uh, a sweat and tears with uh, Denny over the years. We'll, we'll go into that uh, at some point on another podcast. Uh, it, one thing led to another. All of a sudden, uh, I'm working with Harry Humphreys, who is one of Dick's uh, uh, teammates, probably his best and dearest friend uh, back in Vietnam. Uh, their exploits are, are off the charts as far as the things that, that they did together over in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Harry became a really good friend of mine. Now he, he is a very much sought after tech advisor. If you see any movie that's got Navy SEALs or military action in it, uh, Harry uh, was probably the technical advisor for it. Some of the biggest blockbuster uh, movies that uh, that have come out in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, one thing led to another. I ended up back uh, at Blackwater with a gentleman named Gary Jackson uh, doing some work at, at Blackwater and all that. Another, uh, I think he was SEAL Team 2. Uh, uh, again, spend a lot of time talking to him about all kinds of things. I, I was there when they got their first contract uh, from uh, uh, Rummy uh, Rumsfeld for uh, creating what became the largest private army in the entire world, actually. And so I learned a lot, a lot about that. Uh, that led to my introduction to another uh, Navy SEAL named Dave Hall, who uh, is is a dear friend of mine. Uh, Again, Dave is, is one of those guys that uh, is kind of a legend in the teams. Uh, just a, a super down-to-earth guy. We've become very good friends with him and his family. Uh, talk to him all the time. Uh, again, huge influence on me. And then uh, that also led to uh, uh, an introduction to a gentleman named Larry Yatch. And we, we actually have a podcast with Larry. And, uh, you know, we're moving forward in time here to uh, the last uh, five or six years. Larry, although I've known him longer than that, uh, he's, he's been a guest at my house. He's stayed up with me at uh, my cabin in the North Woods uh, for weeks at a time, uh, him and his family. And anyway, um, Larry actually came on board with us uh, as a mentor, uh, business advisor, along with a gentleman named Rick Green. And uh, they actually were our closest confidants uh, for a number of years with the business. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, so you'll get to know Larry Yatch uh, uh, if, if you listen to our podcast for any amount of time. Uh, Mike Ferguson was the uh, uh, combat fighting instructor for the 
for the Navy uh, SEAL training for a number of years, became a very good friend of mine, uh, went down to Coronado several times, did some training with them and all that, uh, and also uh, became uh, really good friends with a gentleman who at the time was the RTD&E officer down at Coronado, a gentleman named Nick North, uh, when we were developing knives uh, specifically for uh, the Navy SEAL teams. Uh, Nick uh, would have me down to Coronado on a pretty regular basis and uh, was just another really interesting guy. He told me he had the best job in the world because uh, he got to do uh, all the fun stuff with all the new gadgets that, uh, I mean, his role was basically find the the best stuff that exists on the planet Earth to to give these guys the best uh, gear and tools. So uh, he was probably right about having the coolest job on Earth. So anyway, it's, it's just been... Uh, something that uh, has woven itself into the fabric of our company and into my personal life. Uh, you know, I've, I've had a chance to uh, uh, work with the guys uh, for a long, long time. Uh, I, I actually taught uh, some classes from time to time uh, with the teams and actually to the teams. So it's it's been something that uh, has been basically... Uh, a, Pretty much the best times of my uh, professional uh, career uh, is being associated with these guys that are at such elite uh, levels of performance and action. And uh, you know, it's funny because uh, I see him on the news all the time, and, and it's like I know that guy. <laughs> and, and I mean, that goes for you know from Chris Kyle to uh, to uh, the guys who shot uh, Osama bin Laden and all that good stuff. So it, it's just been a, it's, it's hugely cool for us. And, you know, it's funny because it, here's the deal, you know, the, you've got all these forums and stuff and, you know, I would talk about things from time to time. And, and one guy uh, put a post up and it said, oh, Ernest Emerson, he's just a Navy SEAL wannabe. Um, and uh, a bunch of guys piled on. It's like, yeah, he's, he thinks he's a Navy SEAL and all that bullshit. And I was like, <laughs> no, not true. But uh, my response to them was this sentence. I said, you're damn right. I'm a Navy SEAL wannabe. What kind of man would not want to be a Navy SEAL? And when I posted that back on that forum, all we heard were crickets after that. So... Having said that, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a couple of Navy SEALs that wrote a book called Extreme Ownership, written by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. And I haven't met Jocko yet. Uh, we, we've corresponded a little bit uh, via the uh, Internet. Uh, Leif, I've known for a little, little time. He, he knows my daughter pretty well also, and we've, we've done some stuff for those guys uh, from time to time. But uh, what I found in their book was just incredible information uh, that we related to 100%, uh, both in a personal way and, and also in the business sense. And uh, having uh, Larry uh, Yatch and, and uh, Rick Green uh, on board with us for three or four years uh, – I was reading this book and I was going, oh my gosh, the, we're talking about the same exact things here and the things that we did. And then uh, I got the book a couple of years back and started, uh, you know, refreshing myself and reinforcing some of the things that we're done. So this is going to be our first book review and it's going to be a book review that's a little different uh, than any other book review I think that I've ever heard. And I, I'm I'm pretty sure it's probably the most different book review that uh, that uh, Jocko and, and Leif have ever had about their book. Because w what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some passages from the book, and then I'm going to I'm going to let you know exactly how those things applied to our business, and uh, and made a change in, in who we are and what we do. So, without further ado, uh, we're going to look at extreme ownership, and this is chapter one. Uh, by Jocko Willink. And I've highlighted some of the things in the book, so uh, bear with me as I read them. Um, and again, I'm just kind of picking and choosing the, the high points that, that, we, uh, that relate directly to us. Could there be any other reasons your plan wasn't successfully executed, I asked. Absolutely, the VP answered. 
The market has been tough. New technology advancements have taken some time to work through. Everyone got focused on products that never really amounted to much. So, yeah, there's a, a host of reasons. Well, those may all be factors, but there's one important reason why this plan failed, I said. And that's Jocko talking. Why is that? The VPA inquired. I paused for a moment to see if the VP was ready for what I had to tell him. The impact would be uncomfortable, but there was no way around it. I stated it plainly. You, you are the reason. The VP was surprised. Then defensive. Me? I came up with the plan. I delivered it over and over. It's, it's not my fault that they aren't executing it. I listened patiently. I explained the direct responsibility of a leader included getting people to listen, support, and execute plans. To drive the point home, I told them. You can't make people listen to. You can't make them execute. That might be a temporary solution for a simple task, but to implement, implement real change, to drive people to accomplish something truly complex or difficult or dangerous, you can't make people do those things. You have to lead them. I did lead them, the VP protested. They just didn't execute. Combat is a dangerous, complex, dynamic situation where all kinds of things can go sideways in a hurry with life and death consequences. There's no way to control every decision, every person, every occurrence that happens there. It is just impossible. But let me tell you something. When things went wrong, you know who I blamed? I asked, pausing slightly for this to sink in. Me. I said I blamed me. The VP contemplated all this, and after thoughtful silence, he responded, I thought I was a good leader. I've always been in leadership positions. Well, that might be one of the issues in your mind, and you are doing everything right. Check that. That might be one of the issues in your mind. You're doing everything right. So when thing goes wrong, things go wrong, instead of looking at yourself, you blame others. But no one's infallible. How can you get your team to most effectively execute a plan in order to accomplish a mission, I continued? That is the question you have to ask yourself. That is what extreme ownership is all about. Now, for us, uh, I'll tell you where I was. And I've got some notes here about it. You know, although I had followed a personal philosophy of... uh, personal responsibility for years and years since I was about 25 years old uh, and I actually talked about it in the lead into this podcast uh, I, w- I was faltering when it came to business and making that connection between personal and business responsibility uh, it, and it's driven by a whole bunch of different uh, uh, motivations uh, one bit being that I'm a very driven person and I demand uh, Basically, I expect a high level of performance from those around me. Uh, Unfortunately, my family can also attest to that. Uh, So I assumed that if I gave an order, it would be executed and carried out uh, without question. Uh, I assumed, therefore, and I knew that failure to succeed was their non-performance, not mine. And that's exactly what Jocko was talking to that VP about. But then I realized that no one was me but me, and I couldn't expect anyone else to be me. That was really an epiphany, and that cleared the smoke. I expected others to be as involved and committed as I was. What they needed was they needed me to lead and not command. And that that was a big change, and that came uh, basically, you know, when we had guys like Larry in here and, and uh, you know, I'm reading the book and, and I'm, I'm kind of learning on the, on the fly. Uh, but it, what it came down to is just being able to see things clearly and simply and objectively. And I, I don't mean things. I'm talking about myself. Uh, and at that point, I was like, you know, these guys are right. Uh, they're telling me things that, uh, that they know works. Uh, I got to start to listen. And uh, once, I, once I truly uh, uh, took off my filter, so to speak, uh, I was able to really understand that. And, and it made a huge, huge difference in the way that I 
viewed uh, the people that uh, work at this company. So we're going to move on to Chapter 2, which is no bad teams, only bad leaders. And this one is Leif, his chapter. I told the Bud's uh, boat crew leader story to this group, how boat crew six turned their performance around under new leadership. And I outlined the concept that there are no bad teams, only bad leaders. During my own training and performance in Bud's as a boat crew leader, I told them I can remember many times when my boat crew struggled. It was easy to make excuses for our team's performance and why it wasn't what it should have been. But I learned that good leaders don't make excuses. Instead, they figure out a way to get it done and to win. Moving on. His attitude reflected victimization. And he's talking about one of the boat crew leaders. <clears throat> Life dealt him and his boat crew members a disadvantage. <clears throat> Excuse me which justified their poor performance. As a result, his attitude prevented the team from looking inwardly at themselves uh, and where they could improve. Finally, the leader and each member of Boat Crew uh, 6 focused not on the mission but on themselves, their own exhaustion, misery, and individual pain and suffering. Though the instructors demanded that they do better, Boat Crew 6 had become comfortable with substandard performance, working under poor leadership in an unending cycle of blame. The team constantly failed. No one took ownership, assumed responsibility, or adopted a winning attitude. And then uh, he, he goes on that they replaced the leader and brought in a new guy. It says, the new leader of Boat Crew 6 focused his team on the mission. Rather than tolerate their bickering and infighting, he pulled the team together and focused their collective efforts on the single specific goal of winning the race. He established a new and higher standard of performance and accepted nothing less from the men in his crew. Extreme ownership, good leadership, is contagious. The new leader in Boat Crew 2 instilled a culture of extreme ownership. And it goes on to say, uh, as a result, Boat Crew 2 continued to outperform virtually every other boat crew and vied with boat crew six for the first place in nearly every race in summary i told them whether or not your team succeeds or fails it is all on you extreme ownership is a concept to help you make the right decisions as a key leader so that you can win and what these things uh meant to me were I had a, a ship supervisor, a guy named uh, Sean, and uh, he was one of those guys that, that he played favorites and, and actually at times pitted you know other employees against each other and, and played favorites with guys, giving them overtime and you know making excuses for things that they had done wrong and all that. And you know, I had assumed that uh, Sean was really taking care of business, so to speak, and uh, you know, he, he had all of the uh, facade of being a, a pretty squared away guy and everything. But, uh, you know, he, he always made it seem like it was the crew's fault that, uh, you know, he was doing everything he could uh, and, and would always tell me what guy had messed up this or what, what uh, you know, a guy did a bad setup and, and, and built a whole bunch of bad parts and everything and, and was always that everything was good until it left his hands. And uh, he never would... Uh, once ever take responsibility for things things going wrong, and uh, none of the people in the in the business, uh, the work crew, uh, thought that they were on a team. It, there was no team. Uh, it was just a bunch of disparate uh, people coming in and doing a job uh, without any relationship to the, any any of the other people on the uh, uh, in the crew. And actually, uh, Danny, <laughs> before you came on board and all that, you weren't here at that time, but he was driving this company into the ground. And I mean, driving it down into the ground. And at some point, uh, you know, I became more involved in 
you know, what the heck's going on here? I know we've got a good product. I know we're making sales, but uh, why is our, our overhead so extremely high? Why are we having so much trouble getting uh, our parts out? And, and why does it seem like we're buying more material than we're producing uh, out at the, at the end of the uh, uh, assembly process? And I uh, started to peel back some of these things and realized that this guy was not a good leader and he wasn't the guy that we needed to do the job. So uh, eventually I let, I let him go. And then we brought in a, a guy who actually came from uh, Naval Special Warfare, uh, a guy named Derek Russell. And uh, Derek uh, never uh, became a SEAL, but he worked down there for about 12 years and uh God love him. Uh, he's passed away now, but uh, he had gone through buds a couple of times, uh, and literally was was actually DQ'd because of uh, he, he had a catastrophic knee failure, uh, had an operation, uh, came back, went through buds again, uh, and had another catastrophic knee failure of the same knee, and uh, he wanted to be uh, a, a team guy just about as much as any other person on earth. And uh, Denny, who was the uh, command master chief of uh, of Buds at that time, uh, liked him so well that uh, he actually kept him on. Uh, Derek went to him and said, man, there's nothing on this earth I ever wanted to do more than be a Navy SEAL. Uh, uh, don't stick me out on a ship somewhere, please. And uh, Denny uh, saw in Derek... Uh, the character and the and the the qualities of of an extremely fine individual, and so he kept him on in supply, which was something that had never happened. Derek was like the first guy that uh, didn't complete buds, but got to stay on with Naval Special Warfare. So, uh, having said that, uh, you know we brought Derek in. Uh, he brought that idea of ownership and responsibility to uh, our program, and uh, put these uh, put this crew back together. Our, our people and uh, uh, was was a good friend of theirs but at the same time was a, was a huge uh, command presence if you will uh, when he walked in the room uh, you knew that somebody had come through the door that's for darn sure uh, and anyway uh, he got things squared away and uh, unfortunately he also uh, found a lot of things uh, Danny uh, you may have even been aware of some of this we found boxes of parts I mean, literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of parts that had been uh, boxed up and taped up and then stashed away somewhere in the, in the attic, so to speak, or in the dark corner and uh, that, the, that our first uh, uh, supervisor had uh, hidden uh, from me and from, from everybody. So Derek uh, did a, a house cleaning. And... You know, it's it's funny because all these people that uh, we had had these discussions about, well, we should let this guy go because he's a non-performer and, you know, this guy doesn't have a good attitude. Well, lo and behold, once uh, we had the right person uh, in charge, uh, all those all those problems started to go away. And some of these individuals uh, now that had direction and knew what they were supposed to do and, and uh, uh, f- knew that they were on a team, that this was a, a team effort, uh, they became good performers. And... Danny, we've got uh, we got a good portion of them still left out of here in the shop after uh, 25 years. Some of those same people, and, and some of those people, we we had serious discussions about about letting them go. Uh, but you know that made all the difference in the world. So, you know, we went from a bad leader uh, to a good leader, and uh, realized that face to face. So, on to the next chapter. Believe, and that is also uh, Jocko's chapter. And in Believe, Jocko says, How's the workshop going? The CEO inquired. It's going pretty well, I said. You have a solid crew of managers. Absolutely, they're a great group, replied the CEO. How is your relationship with them? I asked. Well, I think it's very strong with most of them. Some of the newer ones I don't all know all that well yet, but as a whole, I have a good relationship with our managers. Do they ever confront you or ask you any questions? I asked. The CEO thought for a few seconds. Not really. Uh, And this was a gal. She acknowledged. I think they get the business, and I think they know what they're trying to do, so there really isn't much they need to confront me on. I've been in the game a long time. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't know what I was doing. They know that I think uh, 
They know that, and I think they respect it. Experience counts for a lot in business. But I think if they had an issue, they would, they'd bring it up to me. A common misperception among military leaders or corporate senior executives, this was an example of a boss who didn't fully comprehend, comprehend the weight of her position. In her mind, she was fairly laid back, open to questions, comments, and suggestions from her people. She talked about maintaining an open-door policy. But in the minds of her sales managers, she was still the boss. Experienced, smart, and most importantly, powerful. That position demanded a high level of reverence. So high, in fact, that for an employee to question her ideas seemed disrespectful. None of them were comfortable questioning her. Even though none of the managers actually worried about losing their jobs because they would ask a question, but they were worried about looking bad in front of the boss. So what happened here with us was almost exactly that, that same uh, situation. And, you know, I thought our people had a really clear, open channel. And, uh, and in my mind, I was ready to hear the criticisms, ready to hear uh, suggestions, ready to hear uh, anything that they wanted to say to me. And uh, one of the things that, that I didn't understand was I was waiting for them to talk to me. And Jocko goes on to say, uh, what's that? The CEO asked, incredulous. Because Jocko had said just previously, that sounds brilliant, but there's only one problem with it. And what was that? Your mid-level managers don't understand the points. They don't understand why. And they don't believe in the strategy. If they don't believe, neither will your sales force. If this plan rolls out and those executing it don't believe in it, your plan is far more likely to fail. And what that did for me was basically point to the fact that, again, I'm waiting for them to, to contact me with information from the floor, things that they would need or th suggestions that, that they would make. And, you know, one of the big things is, although I, know, I knew this, uh, you know, I'm married, I have children, uh, have, a, have a, a buoyant personal life. Uh, you know, in a marriage, you know, everything's a, a two-way street. Uh, there's no uh, my way or the highway. And what I didn't realize is that in my business, again, you know, not really quite yet understanding that uh, the principles are the same uh, on the job as they are off the job. They just change uh, uh, the playing field. Is that they expected me to communicate everything to them and I expected to... Uh, have them communicate everything back to me, but what was really going on is I wasn't communicating to them uh, hardly at all. They didn't know what my strategies were. They didn't know what my overall view of the company was. They didn't know where my plans lay for, for the future of the company. And so uh, with Larry and Rick, uh, one of the things that they did was they said, man, you, you've got to have meetings, and you've got to have them on a regular, ongoing basis. And it's got to be, you have to show them uh, firsthand that if someone says something that might seem critical or might actually be critical, that there's no repercussions from that. But you, you may actually be that way, and he's talking to me, uh, but they don't know that. So your failure to communicate uh, is causing this problem. So you got to get down there uh, in the trenches and, uh, and talk to these people and make them comfortable that you are not uh, a guy who's going to hold negative uh, uh, reaction against any of their um, suggestions or criticisms or comments. And, and lo and behold, we started to do that. We started to do that on, on a really regular basis, and uh, it took off uh, from there. And now we have a, uh, a very, very high... Um, uh, communications uh, standard. The guys are now comfortable with me and gals, and uh, we have our meetings on a regular basis. In fact, after this podcast, uh, we, we have our scheduled meeting today. Oh, that's right. 
And uh, so, you know, the ability to communicate, uh, use precise language, and also the act of communication, uh, that's a two-way street. Uh, nobody's going to talk to you if you're not going to talk back. And, and that took a while for me to realize it, but uh, we certainly did. So now moving on to Chapter 4, Check the Ego by Jocko Willing. Uh, from the book, Ego clouds and disrupts everything. The planning process, the ability to make good advice, and the ability to accept constructive criticism. It can even stifle someone's sense of self-preservation. Often, the most difficult ego to deal with is your own. Ego has, excuse me, everyone has an ego. Ego drives the most successful people in life, in the SEAL teams, in the military, in the business world. They want to win, to be the best, and that is good. But when ego clouds our judgment and prevents us from seeing the world as it is, then ego becomes destructive. When personal agendas become more important than the team and overarching mission success, performance suffers and failure ensues. Many of the disruptive issues that arise within any team can be attributed directly to a problem with ego. Implementing extreme ownership requires checking your ego and operating with a high degree of humility. Admitting mistakes, taking ownership, and developing a plan to overcome challenges are integral to any successful team. Ego can prevent a leader from conducting an honest, realistic assessment of his or her own performance and the performance of the team. Now, I'm the first one to admit I have a huge ego. Uh, I've known that pretty much most of my adult life. And, uh, but, the, but the point about ego is, again, ego is a necessary uh, aspect of success. You have to have confidence. You have to think you're the best to be the best. Uh, and, and I got that. But you know, at the same time, being in a position that I was in in my field, uh, you know, as a as a knife designer of, you know, some of the most you know iconic and influential knife designs in the, in the history of uh, of the the cutlery industry, uh, you know, I'd I'd been a, inducted into the Hall of Fame and in, in uh, the black in martial arts and, and black belt Hall of Fame, uh, you know, I had. You know some of the best-selling knives in the in the history uh, of the industry. Uh, you know I had stuff exhibited at the Met and the Metropolitan Museum. I mean, excuse me, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and the Smithsonian. It was tough to uh, uh, keep that ego in check because you know we we had had a lot of successes, and you know I I I I did this I did that. Some of the things literally were just me by myself doing them like like i said the, the the hall of fame stuff but really what was going on was it was we 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 and it has always been we 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 and and i wasn't able to clearly see that and you know by by getting these accolades and, and having people uh, you know for lack of a better term give me the rewards of 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 my efforts and uh, things like that, it's real tough not to start believing uh, your own press and to actually think that it is all about me or I am the one who, who created this or is responsible for it. And, and in reality, uh, as we all know, that, that's never the case. Uh, even a guy who is, let's say, a uh, 100-yard uh, or a 100-meter uh, sprinter where you know, it's a single man uh, who wins the race, well, you know what? Yeah, he was the guy who stepped across the finish line, but there was a, a, a herd of people behind him uh, for his whole life that had been pushing him towards that, that, that finish line. No, nothing's ever done uh, by, by yourself or on a singular level. And, you know, we can't, you can't get to the moon by yourself. That, that's a fact. There, there's a, you know, that, that can never happen. And, uh, you know, all of those things that I was talking about, those, those awards or, or uh, uh, 
accomplishments. You know, none of that really matters as a leader. Uh, I am. Uh, doesn't matter who I am or, or who I want others to think I am. Uh, that has nothing to do with leadership. Uh, you know, I was of the opinion, you know, that, that, you know, my ideas are all good ideas. You know, why can't uh, you guys just make them work? And then I, I truly realized that uh, I only exist because of them, the people uh, around me, the people that, that execute uh, the things that uh, we're able to do. And once I realized that, it allowed me to, to see how little I mattered and how much they mattered. And once that happened, it became evident that it was the mission that mattered. It wasn't about any individual. It was about getting the job done, accomplishing the mission. And once I was able to kind of see clearly through that, uh, again, that, that opened up, that was part of uh, opening up those lines of communication. And, and I hope you guys understand something. As I'm going through this kind of chapter by chapter briefly, uh, there's a lot of things that are contingent upon a lot of the other things in this, in either previous chapters or chapters to come. So uh, in order for me to truly understand my people and, and, and relate to them uh, with my ego in check, uh, I had to have those communication skills uh, that we just talked about. So on to the next chapter, Danny. Uh, cover and Move. And Cover and Move was uh, one that was written by Leif. And uh, this one we could relate to uh, real real clearly. And uh, I'll just read a little bit here. Uh, These guys are horrible, said the production manager. He described a subsidiary company owned by uh, another co- corporation on which his team depended to transport the product. They can't get their jobs completed on schedule. And that prevents us from doing our jobs. Clearly, there were major issues between his field leaders, the frontline troops of his team, and those of the subsidiary company. And the production manager explained that his team struggled to minimize downtime in their production, the times when they had to actually cease making their product. And these disruptions occurred for a variety of reasons. But they stopped product from moving to market, and every hour, and day of downtime cost the company huge revenues and substantially impacted the bottom line. And one of the things that was happening was in our business was we depended on outside vendors for a variety of different operations. Uh, Heat treating, for one, uh, double disc grinding, uh, coding uh, and at one time uh, actually the uh, putting the logos on the knives and uh, some of that's changed now uh, we've brought some of these things in-house but there was a long time when we uh, really depended on outside vendors on their schedules uh, to uh, get our product from start to finish from the from the raw piece of steel that came in to uh, the finished product as it went out the door and uh, We found out that uh, we couldn't count on our vendors uh, because uh, we would send things out, and and sometimes uh, they would be at a vendor for a week. Sometimes they'd be at a vendor for two weeks. Sometimes they'd be at a vendor for three or four weeks. It all depended on what their workload was and what we were supplying them. And... uh, we just we couldn't do any forecasting. I, if someone asked me, you know, how long does it take you to go from start to finish on your product, uh, we had to make up a number because we could not. Uh, we had nothing in our hands that we could actually look at and say, okay, these knives uh, or these products are going to be at this vendor for this amount of time and at this vendor for this amount of time. And you know, once I realized, really, and again, you think you'd think that you'd know these things just through common sense but i'll tell you what sometimes you you can't see the forest uh because of all the trees and uh so if i sound stupid uh, again i've got to tell you i i really had no business uh background so you know once i realized that you know how much you know my company depended on their performance i realized that i needed their support 
and their best efforts. And, and rather than, than, than cursing about those guys and saying, oh, those dirty, rotten, you know, devils, uh, why do they take so dang long? And, you know, what's wrong with those guys? And calling them up on the phone and haranguing them and, you know, get our stuff done and all that good stuff, uh, which, you know, really didn't seem to do much good because we'd just be back on the phone, you know, two weeks later having the same conversation. You know, once I realized that, uh, uh, the question then became, you know, rather than, you know, how can these guys help us? Uh, once uh, Larry and, and some of the guys that uh, we were talking to uh, said, Ernie, you got to understand something. You got to ask the question, uh, how can uh, you help them? And, and that was a huge uh, turning point because once I made that uh or, or, or became aware became aware of that that the guys pointed that out to me you know how can we help them that changed the dynamics in a complete way and uh that that allowed us uh you know to to meet somewhere in the middle because what we did then immediately was uh we had uh people go out to these various vendors and say look here's what we need uh we know uh that you guys need us as a business uh let's let's meet somewhere in the middle what what can we do to help you uh run your business better. In other words, uh, when would you like to have product? How, how much would you like to have at each time? Uh, what would what would your schedule work best for you and, and that we could slot into and all that? And once we opened up that dialogue, all of a sudden uh, these guys uh, realized that we were not in an adversarial uh, position, that we were actually doing something to maybe help them uh, with their scheduling, uh, and that we were flexible enough to... Uh, to make those kind of decisions, uh, we were able to set up uh, schedules. Uh, we were able to set up delivery times, quantities, which, again, helped us on our end. If we knew we had to have 300 units uh, every Tuesday to be delivered over to a, a heat treater or a grinder or, or whatever the, that vendor was, uh, then that gave us uh, the ability to say, okay, now we set up on our end to supply those numbers at those times uh, and to those guys. And we actually uh, got to the point where we, we looked for other vendors that were close that uh, so we could minimize downtime between uh, uh, travel and stuff like that between the different vendors because sometimes we could send them out to uh, one vendor uh, and they'd go right directly to another vendor uh, afterwards before they even came back to us. So we, once we realized that, uh, that we had to look at it like how do we help them, then all of a sudden they – helped us and uh, that made a huge difference in our ability to we, we shortened our downtime danny what, what was by six or eight weeks yeah i think we cut it in half didn't we yeah just just by doing that and so uh you know we, we were able to get a realistic schedule and uh it may not have been my fantasy best schedule because they still had to go out and uh and uh be out of our hands for a period of time but at least we had a schedule, and once we had a schedule, then we could quite simply just work to that schedule, and uh, we we became uh, a better friendly uh, uh, relationships with all our vendors. So now on to uh, Chapter 6, Simple, uh, a chapter written by Jocko. And Jocko says... This actually isn't surprising to me, I said. Your plan violates one of the most important principles we adhered to in combat, in combat, simplicity. When young SEAL leaders in training look at targets for training missions, they often try to develop a course of action that accounts for every single possibility they can think of. That results in a plan that is extraordinarily complex and very difficult to follow. While the troops might understand their individual pieces of the plan, they have a hard time following all the intricacies of a grand scheme. Perhaps they can even get away with that a few times if everything goes smoothly. But remember, the enemy gets a vote. The enemy gets a vote? The plant manager repeated, questioning what I had meant. Yes. The enemy gets their say as well, and they're going to do something to disrupt it. When something goes wrong, and eventually it does, complexity in planning adds to confusion, which can compound into disaster. Almost no mission ever goes according to plan. There are too many variables to deal with, and that is why simplicity is the key. If the plan is simple enough, everyone understands it. 
which means every person can rapidly adjust and modify what he or she is doing. If it's too complex, the team can't make rapid adjustments to it because there's no baseline understanding of it. The thing about being simple is this, and this is something that happened, again, it was such a splash of cold water in my face. I was like, God, uh, why didn't I think of that? It was so freaking obvious to us. Well, there, there's the acronym, acronym KISS, and you know what that is, right? Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, that's, that's something that, uh, you know, there's a reason that that keeps coming up uh, in 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 life, so to speak. So, uh, because it's true, uh, the simpler things uh, I, I just work better. And anyway, even when it comes to machines, a, a simple machine, uh, we've got machines out back that we've bought that uh, were very simple machines, but uh, they're fifty, sixty, seventy years old. Some of them, and, and they're they're just as good today as they were when we we bought them. As opposed to some of the newer machines we buy, they uh, seems like they're always breaking down some component goes wrong here and there but i'll tell you what happened uh, the very first day that uh, larry uh, yatch uh, and uh, rick green walked into our business uh, as our business mentors uh, they changed our bottom line in fact uh, they changed our bottom line within what was it danny maybe 35 45 minutes of walking uh, that's what the, i was uh, gonna say yeah yeah it, it was it was an amazing uh, thing to actually see, and uh, we had a guy who was working on our uh, our. Uh, it's called a burger machine. It, it grinds the, all the bevels on the on the knife blades, and they wanted to just take a walk through the shop with us. And uh, so we walked out there, and they ended up walking by the uh, the grinding area. And there was a shelf there, that, and it probably had thirty five or forty uh, uh, wooden boxes with all these blades stacked up on, in it. And they both looked at him and said, well, you know, what are these? And I said, those are blades. And they go, well, why are they sitting on this shelf? And I said, well, they're, they're waiting to be ground. And they said, well, if every one of these blades represents a knife that can be sold, yeah, we're looking at several hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting on this shelf. And I said, yeah, I guess so. And they said, well, why aren't they being ground? And I said, well, our grinder... Uh, you know he's he's a good guy and and he he's out here working all day long. I just don't know. Uh, you know we're, we're we're having a tough time getting these knives ground. Uh, you know he's 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 trying to do a good job and everything. And and you know Larry looked at me and said, "Well, how many knives is he supposed to grind a day?" And I said, "Well, whatever he can get done." You have kind of shrugged our shoulders, like <laughs> yeah. And he said, "That's not an answer." I'm going to ask you again, how many knives is he supposed to grind in a day? And I said, I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, he's probably averaging about 50 or 60 knives a day, wasn't he, Danny? Something like that? Yeah. Something like that. And, uh, you know, I started saying, well, there's setup time and, you know, got to do one side then the other. And he goes, no, 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 no. How many blades would this machine grind in a day? Let's, let's look at that. So how long does it take to uh, grind a blade? Uh, it takes a lot, like a let's just say a minute for one side, a minute for the other side. How long does it take to set up the machine? And uh, I really didn't, didn't even have an answer for that. But Danny and I knew enough to to that it really was about an hour to uh, if if we switched from blade A to uh, model C, uh, it takes about an hour. And so Larry said, "Okay, so there's eight hours in a day. You take an hour away for setup." Uh, that's uh, seven hours of, of grinding time. Put in uh, lunchtime, two breaks, etc. And he said, so, you know, we're going to come up with a number. And I said, okay. And, and they said, Let, let's, uh, let's do this for a moment. And uh, he and Rick talked for a moment. And then they said, uh, we think that this machine should produce at a minimum 200 blades a day. And I said, well, that, that would be a miracle. And he goes, no, that's, that's a reality. And so I said, well, what do we do? Well, have you told him how many blades he's supposed to do a day? And I said, no. And he goes, yeah, because you don't know how many blades uh, 
he's supposed to do in a day because you didn't even know how many blades the machine could do in the day. And I said, yeah, I guess you're right. And uh, I was feeling kind of stupid at the time. And uh, anyway, you know, I was, I was standing there with kind of a, <laughs> a dumb look on my face, which I started to realize was a pretty common look for me uh, once these guys came in and started uh, uh, schooling me up, so to speak. And uh, Rick looked over and he said, uh, do you have a whiteboard? And I said, yeah. He goes, go get it. So I went and got the whiteboard, and he said, here's what we're going to do. Uh, he doesn't know how many blades he's supposed to do in a day. You don't know how many blades he's supposed to do in a day. I feel your frustration uh, in that you think in your gut you know that uh, this machine can do more. Uh, we're looking at those boxes of blades. He goes, Ernest, you got to understand something. Think about it. every one of those boxes as a uh, box full of money, and, and you're just putting it up on a shelf. Uh, and this is about the middle of your process. So you've got, a, you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that you could be using in other uh, aspects of your business sitting out here on these shelves. For gosh sakes, uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put the whiteboard on that uh, machine, and it's going to say 200 blades per day required in big magic marker bold letters and you're going to go over to him and you're going to say Andy you need to be able to uh, do this many blades in a day do it right now and so I went over and I said Andy we're, we're putting up this whiteboard uh, we know that uh, the machine can do this many blades a day so uh, the new standard in order for us to, to make this business work uh, up better and more efficiently is that y you've got to step up and we've got to have 200 blades a day and uh, he didn't really resist or anything. Uh, he, he said, okay, uh, I'll, I don't know, but I'll try. And, uh, you know, that was about, honest, that was about 9 o'clock in the morning. We were already a couple hours into the day. And uh, at the end of the day, and he was supposed to, uh, you know, we had the 200 uh, requirement, and then we had a column that said actual blades ground. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we went back out, and he had ground 243 blades. So not only did he meet our minimum requirement, he actually exceeded the minimum requirement. And it was strictly uh, because we had not given him uh, a simple direction. This is what we know the machine can do, and this is what we know you can do, uh, and this is what we have to have. And, uh, you know, it, it was that simple putting a whiteboard on that machine and you know it was listed monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday so that every day uh we could see he could see and everybody else could see uh, what he was doing on that grinder so you know simple things like that uh make huge differences and you know by by not having something uh that that's simple that the that the employees could understand um uh, in keeping it nebulous and 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 me being pissed off at them for for not uh doing what I thought they they should do was really my inability to communicate in actual simple terms a plan that these guys could implement i mean honest how simple is it to say hey this is what uh you need to do each day and yet i didn't and wasn't doing that so again you know those things uh, make a huge difference. That that changed our bottom line, and, and actually, we we uh, we knocked out those uh, shelves full of boxes within about uh, three or four weeks, and it, and it uh, it did change our bottom line in a, in a huge way. So, on to uh, chapter number seven. This one written by Jocko. Uh, prioritize and execute. Uh, Reading from the book, the CEO of this pharmaceutical company brought me in for a leadership and training consultation. The CEO and his executives prepared a state of the company uh, brief that detailed the company's strategic uh, vision in order to improve performance. The brief included multiple sections, each with a number of tasks and projects embedded within. He sat me down and ran through the brief so I could get a feel for what they were doing. Uh, contained a plethora of new in initiatives, each with its own set of challenges. And 
first, the CEO planned to launch uh, several uh, lines of new products, each with its own marketing plan. And with the aim of expansion, the CEO hoped to establish distribution centers in a dozen new markets uh, in the next 18 to 24 months. Additionally, he planned to break into the laboratory equipment market, which he hoped to sell through their access to doctors and hospitals. And additionally, the company planned a complete website overhaul to update their antiquated site and improve customer experience and branding. He went on into great detail through a multitude of very impressive sounding plans and was clearly passionate about the company and excited to implement this array of new initiatives to get the company back on track. At the end of the brief, the CEO asked if I, and this is Jocko, had any questions. Have you ever heard the military term decisively engaged, I asked. No, I wasn't in the military, the CEO replied. Decisively engaged, I continued, is a term to describe a battle in which a unit locked in a tough combat situation cannot maneuver or extricate themselves. In other words, they cannot retreat. They must win. With all your new initiatives, I would say you have a hell of a lot of battles going on. Absolutely. Uh, We are spread pretty thin, the CEO acknowledged, wondering where this was going. Of all the initiatives, which one do you feel is the most important, I asked. What is your highest priority? Moving on. Jocko again. With all that you have planned, do you think your team is clear that this is your highest priority, I asked? Probably not, the CEO continued. Priorities. I'm a creative individual. I can create things and ideas and plans and marketing strategies and all of kinds of stuff. Uh, that, that's, I think, the best hat that I wear, uh, maybe, as an individual, uh, is that uh, you know, my goal is to supply the things that the company can make. But... I can supply ideas or, 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 you know, way faster than, than my team, uh, my business could execute. Uh, so what we were in uh, was a constant state of multiple projects all in work, all of them just started or, or maybe half finished, uh, but not completed. And again, you know, Danny, uh, you know, we constantly are trying to shave off uh, days, uh, even half days, from our production schedule, from the from the time that we put a piece of steel on our laser to the time that that uh, end product is boxed up uh, and sent out the door. Yes, uh, it, it's it's something that is vitally important to our vendors that so that the stores can can count on having product on an ongoing basis. It's it's vitally important to us so that we have uh, uh, cash flow. In other words, we spend all that money up front, and we got to have that money coming back in at the end. And so, uh, what I was doing, uh, again, without realizing it, with you know, with my ego uh, not being in check and all that, uh, I was constantly feeding these ideas, and I was constantly saying, "Hey, let's do this. Let's let's do this." Danny, design this thing uh, to hold this part, so that we can make uh, uh, whirly gigs and, and things that we can put into this product. Uh, you know, let's let's design a new uh, website. Let's let's completely change the color on scheme on everything. Let's let's get a bunch of uh, movies and pictures and let's do this and let's put this up on, on the website. Let's uh, let's let's uh, develop new products that uh, we can spin off from our uh, original uh, uh, product line that we make, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it was constant, and I was like a little kid in in a, on a playground with with a hundred. Uh, 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 toys to play with and I, I never got a chance to really play with any of them I, I just got all this, these things started and of course everyone out there uh, because I was the, the boss if you will uh, was eager to please me which meant dang I didn't get this other thing done yet and he's already asked me to you know, start this new project I better start this new project show, to show him that uh, I'm doing something and what I didn't realize is that Man, I was a 
I was an anchor. I was a huge anchor on on the time and how it was spent. And uh, one of the things that uh, that the guys told me, uh, Larry and, and Rick, was like, Ernie, you got to understand something. Uh, they're all good ideas uh, until they can't be executed. And you're just throwing way too many uh, things into the process. You, you have to prioritize. There's only one way, one only, to get your product uh, through these pipelines, and that's to prioritize. Your projects, yeah, they can, they can be done, but they have to fall in, into a queue. They have to be uh, somewhere on this ladder of what is priority number one, what's priority number two, priority number three, etc., uh, in order to get things finished, because you got to finish the first jobs uh, before you can start the the twenty fifth job that you're you're throwing in there, and uh, in order to finish the first job, you have to finish the second job, and then you have to finish the third job. So we're going to set up uh, a meeting here with with you and the family and and uh, your management, and we're going to define the priorities, and we're going to stick to those priorities. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize it, that also I was, I was frustrated all the time. Like, why aren't these projects getting done? You know, Bob, Tim, Jack, whatever. Uh, how come you didn't get those parts done? Or how come you didn't get that, uh, that wood uh, uh, milled to, to the precise thickness? How come we didn't get these uh, special handle material uh, cut out? How come we didn't get this uh, doodad put on? Whatever. So I was constantly frustrated. Uh, again, you know, that extreme ownership, personal responsibility that I talked about a little while ago. Uh, I was thinking it was everybody else's fault, but it was, it was my fault. I had not prioritized. And once these guys set me down and, and, and basically uh, said, Ernie, yeah, we can't let you just run wild here. Uh, we love the, the fact that uh, you're, you're the, uh, the fuel at the, in the middle of this vortex. Uh, but uh, None of those things are good unless they get done. They don't exist unless they're finished. So we're going to have priorities. And it uh, came, came down really to that old saying, you can't put 10 pounds of beans in a, in a five-pound sack. Uh, it just can't work. And, and I was trying to put uh, 50 pounds of beans in a, in a five-pound sack. And so they sat me down. We defined our priorities. We started to make progress. And I'll tell you what, you talk about clearing the smoke, all of a sudden, it was like, okay, we're all on the same priority. We're all working towards the same goal. Uh, you know, things started to get done, and they started to get done uh, much quicker. And again, uh, that struggle to uh, uh, shave time off uh, start to finish on a project uh, became something that we could actually manage. We could feel it. We could see it. We could see where we could apply uh you know, extra effort to get things done, and we saw the results. So defining those priorities, uh, that became a major, major uh, impact on our business. Moving off to uh, Chapter 8, uh, this one is written by Jocko. It's called Decentralized Command, and this was a huge one too. It says, uh, Jocko goes on, can I look at your org chart? We really don't have one that's current, the president responded. Uh, I, I like to hold that information close. If it gets out and people see it, they might uh, get upset that they actually report to someone they see as one of their peers. I've had to deal with this before. So how do they know who's in charge, I asked. Without a clear chain of command, people knowing who's in charge of what, you can't have empowered leadership. And that is critical to the success of any team, including the SEAL teams or your company here. That makes perfect sense, I said. This is Jocko. The SEAL teams in the U.S. military, like much like militaries throughout history, are based around building blocks of four- to six-man teams with a leader. We call them fire teams. This is the ideal number for a leader to lead. Beyond that, any leader can lose control as soon as even minimal pressure is applied to the team when inevitable challenges arise. Jocko again. I could see this had sparked some interest with the president. That is why we had to utilize decentralized command, I explained. I couldn't talk to every shooter and every platoon, squad, and fire team. I would talk to the platoon commander, 
he would take my guidance and pass it down to his squad leaders. His squad leaders would pass it on to their fire team leaders, and then they would execute. Jocko again, that is why simplicity is so important, I answered. Proper decentralized command requires simple, clear, concise orders that can be understood easily by everyone in the chain of command. So, what we had was centralized command, and that command was me. And once this was pointed out to me, and I started reading uh, Jocko and Leif's book and, and really started to you know, understand it, having it laid out by them in, in such precise terms. Uh, we started doing this. Uh, you know, we looked at conversations. Danny, and you and I have had these conversations many, many times about, you know, why don't we bring someone in that knows about this aspect? Or, you know, let's, let's find somebody that can lead these guys uh, or, or be a, uh, a supervisor or a floor, floor supervisor uh, for this or that. And, you know, that's, that's tough to do. I mean, you know, you bring somebody in from the outside. Um, they've got to get to know your company, and uh, they may not, you know, they may not know uh, how your company works. Uh, or they may be actually uh, pulling the wool over your eyes and uh, inflating their uh, their resume, so to speak. And uh, you know, Danny, you and I, we had these conversations uh, again with my wife Mary, who actually turned out to be uh, probably a much better business uh, leader than I am, actually. Uh, we'd have these conversations, and, and she would say, uh, isn't there anybody out there in the shop that can do that? And all of a sudden it was like, you know what? There's a lot of guys out there in that shop that can do that. Who knows our business better than the guys that are actually doing uh, those jobs? You know, is it, is in the NC department, who knows, who knows those NCs better than the guys working on the NCs? They know every nuance of those machines, which one needs to uh, get kicked in the rear end once you turn it on, which one needs to have a little tweak or an adjustment there, uh, You know, which ones are a little faster, which ones uh, are going to be in need of uh, repair or uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, so we looked at that and, and, and realized that these guys know their jobs better than anyone else, so why don't we empower some of those floor people as floor leaders we don't need to bring in other people to tell them what to do they know what to do all they need is a leader and, and it's just like what Jocko was saying uh, we're, we don't have a giant company all of our departments they really are about four people uh, I some of them are, are two people but uh, Danny most of our most of our departments exist uh, about four people in each department yeah, some so, one person. Yeah. So, you know, all those people lead, needed was a little leadership. And it's funny because uh, one of the things that Larry and, and Rick uh, pointed out when they came into our company was, Ernie, you've got a, you're not hurting for leadership. You're, you're hurting for a uh, manager. You need a manager. You need somebody that can define, uh, you know, what, where you're going and then have your leaders implement the, you know, that, that plan or that strategy. And, you know, who is that manager? And I said, well, I guess that manager should be me. And they said, yeah, right. You shouldn't be the guy out there telling somebody to move a box around or, or, uh, you know, do this to this part or whatever. You've got plenty of people in the shop that, that can do that for you. Uh, you have to back off for a little bit because you're, you're, on the verge of micromanaging and uh you got to let these people be uh their own leaders you got to decentralize uh your command uh to let them uh make decisions and empower them to do the things that they know they can do and i was like all right that sounds good to me because again uh having to be out there on the floor all day long every day was you know that was preventing me from doing that creative stuff that that i do enjoy doing and uh so anyway, what we did was we came up with uh, uh, several plans. Uh, we, we implemented uh, uh, lead men in all the different departments from people uh, in those departments. And then uh, we started cross-training. 
uh, we started uh, an, a program to cross train all of our employees uh, to be able to do any of the operations uh, that take place in the shop, and uh, that was also a a, a very valuable. Uh, aspect of what we were trying to put in position in in conjunction with this empowering the the floor leadership was uh letting these people know that there was uh the more that they could learn people love to learn there's there's nothing no question about that and we were kind of keyholing people and this guy only does that and this gal only does that and uh you know i've worked in those positions and that that can end up being a, a drudgery type thing and, and very boring where you come in and do the same exact thing every day. So we started switching these people around, getting them cross-trained uh, on all the other uh, uh, projects so that uh, you know if somebody was absent or somebody did move on to another job, we could fill that position uh, immediately. And uh, the employees uh, brightened up. Everybody liked those kind of things, the new responsibilities. And uh, we also put up something called the big board, which allowed us to categorize all of the operations for all of our for our products. Uh, and we would just had mag uh, little mag uh, plates, if you will, uh, with the name of the batch or the name of the uh, product on it, and it would move along that board, so that anyone in the shop at any moment could go over and see. Uh, where batch number 28 was or batch number 52E or whatever was going on. Uh, And at the same time, uh, we instituted what I called the big long bench. And uh, what we did with that was right underneath this the big board, which has hundreds of of spaces on it for all our products moving uh, across from start to the finish line. It starts with, uh, you know, cutting the, the blanks out on our laser and finishes up with uh, uh, assembly on, on uh, from left to right. And there's about 25 categories in, in betwixt and between. And uh, when we put the big bench out there, the big long bench, about 30 feet long, uh, we were able to put the product on there. And as our, our product, our knives, our, our handles, whatever, the blades, moved uh, through that process, those boxes moved along on the big bench below the big board. Now, what that allowed to do is it allowed us, and everything's categorized. There's great big letters, uh, uh, signs under each uh, station, uh, you know, engraving, uh, heat treating, uh, double disc grind, uh, you know. Each one of those has a category. So when we see boxes stacked up in there, or when the employees see back boxes stacked up on there, they know that, uh, wow, I got to go get some of those boxes and and, and work on yeah, those. Yeah, it created a clarity, physical presence, clarity. Absolutely, we didn't even have to be out there telling people what to do. Now they could just glance over there and see. Oh, you know, I'm working on this uh, station today. There's a box sitting on my uh, 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 my category on that bench. That's what I got to do. So I can just go over and get it. And then uh, one of the other things again. So simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Well, I'm the stupid part of that. Uh, the priority board, Danny. Uh, so that if we had a, a special project, let's say uh, something, uh, let's say the Navy, we make a Navy search and rescue knife and, and we get these knives, uh, we get orders of 75 to 150 knives at a time uh, on a contract. And uh, if if one of those comes in, that that's a priority. So that goes on the priority board. So again, if and, and that priority board has the the name of the, the the knife model. It has the batch number. It has you know when it's supposed to be delivered uh, in big bold letters. Another great big whiteboard. Uh, what happens is uh, someone can look over and they they've got five boxes stacked up on their station and they look at the priority board and they it's called an NSAR. Uh, they see that an NSAR is priority number one and they look at those boxes and in. You know, maybe stacked uh, fifth one underneath down on the bottom says NSAR on it. That's the box that they just go and get because they know that's a priority. They don't have to wait for someone to tell them uh, what the priority is. And they don't have to make the quote unquote mistake of not uh, grabbing a knife or a, or a product that's that's a priority because it's clearly defined. They they look up, they follow that board, they follow those uh, uh, the bench and they follow that priority board. And uh, it's almost like 
we don't hardly have to give any orders at all out there anymore, Danny. <laughs> Our meetings used to be like, you know, why aren't these knives getting done? Why, why isn't this thing moving along? You guys know it's a priority. Well, you know, when you look at a whole bunch of boxes and, and don't know which one to pick. You just grab the first one you see. You just grab the one on top, yeah. So, you know, again, uh, that decentralized command, we that was so decentralized at that point that uh, command actually kind of became a, a, a bench and a board. And uh, it, it's worked out really good for us. It's worked out really good. So going on to uh, Chapter 9, this one's by Leif, The Plan. Um, and I was going to read a whole bunch of stuff from, from this because I'm, uh, the plans are so so important to have. Uh, there's a lot in there. I, I'm just going to say get the book uh, and... Uh, and read the section on planning for sure. Can I borrow yours? <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, you can, Danny. Uh, it's got all kinds of notes and, and, and uh, things highlighted in it. But anyway, let me talk about the plan because uh, Leif had uh, basically uh, outlined uh, all the things that you need to do. And, you know, pri- prioritizing was one thing. That was a big thing. And again, this is one of those crossover things where, you know, one can't exist with the other. You, you can't have a plan. Uh, uh, you know, a strategic mission uh, unless you had priorities. And you can't have priorities unless you had a plan to execute uh, those priorities. So it, it's kind of like two side, each side of the same coin, the yin and yang, if you will. One, one depends on the other. And uh, so, you know, we set up uh, a plan. We set up the priorities. Uh, that allowed us to be able to set up our plans, our strategies, uh, to actually define the strategic mission that we that we were after, it gave us clarity about what was uh, you know low hanging fruit. Again, Larry and Rick said, you know, for gosh sakes, uh, if you've got things that are sitting here waiting uh, to be done because you've got all this these other projects in work, uh, and this thing is like you know, a week away from being finished, where you could actually move it out the door and get that cash flow going, uh, let's set up a plan. To, uh, to address the low-hanging fruit, uh, those are going to automatically move into that position of priority. They're the, they're the closest to done. Uh, they're the easiest to get accomplished. And uh, so we're going to start there. So your plan is, uh, and, and they talked about it uh, like a stream. They said, your plan's going to be defined right now, or your strategies are by, uh, you've got a bunch of stuff uh, jamming up the flow of water down that stream and you got to take out the big boulders first uh, because those are the easiest ones to see and uh, are the easiest ones to uh, to work on so let's get those big boulders out of the way first and uh, you know we couldn't do that uh, because we weren't even seeing the big boulders because we didn't have any priorities and we didn't have a plan uh, we were just kind of navigating our way down that river bumping into rocks uh, and <laughs> And, and treading, treading water. <laughs> treading water, yeah. And uh, we couldn't build a plan if we couldn't define our priorities. And uh, so, again, we looked at it. Uh, and what they said uh, in a short version was, uh, you know, set your goals. Uh, define your strategies. Uh, and then, as a result of that, the strategies are going to define the tactics, the things that you actually have to do. Uh, but when you... Uh, have the strategies, the goals, what's our overall mission, uh, and that gives you a set of tactics, uh, you, you have to be able to evaluate and say, do those tactics support the plan? Are those the right things to do to get this plan executed? And uh, you have to communicate with your people start to finish uh, from goals, the, the goals, the mission, all the way to tactics, to both the, the leaders and the doers. So that we're everyone on that team is working for the same results, and then after that, uh, you have to be able to objectively assess your progress. Uh, you need to be able to sit down uh, and and ask, do your actions support uh, the mission? Uh, you, you have to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of that of the tactics, uh, you know, and, and how are they working uh, towards that uh, that end goal. And if they're working well, 
if if they were good, then you continue. Uh, if they're not, you either eliminate those incorrect uh, tactics or activities, or you have to decide on changing your plan uh, or the mission. That's basically it in a nutshell. And, uh, you know, without a plan, uh, how could I ever focus on the bigger picture if I didn't know clearly uh, what the bigger picture actually was? So that plan uh, became the, the, the strategic mission because uh, the mission defines the plan and the plan becomes the mission is, is really how that kind of works. And once we were able to <clears throat> put that into terms, uh, chunks of knowledge that we could uh, work on, uh, a big thing started to happen at our company, and uh, off we went. So on to Chapter 11. Uh, this one is by Leif, and it's about decisiveness amid uh, uncertainty. Uh, I think, uh, and here's, here's Leif talking. I think I better just, excuse me, that's not Leif. Uh, it's... Uh, one of the people that Leif is uh, working with here. She says, I think I better just let it play its course, Darla started. She had decided not to decide. What makes you say that? And this is Leif. What makes you say that, I ask. In the SEAL teams, we taught our leaders to act decisively amid chaos. Jocko had taught me that as a leader, my default setting should be aggressive, protective, excuse me, Jocko had taught me that as a leader, my default setting should be aggressive, proactive, rather than reactive. This was critical to the success of any team. Instead of letting the situation dictate our decisions, we must dictate the situation. But for many leaders, this mindset was not intuitive. Many operated with a wait-and-see approach. But experience had taught me that the picture could never be complete that that picture could never be complete. There was always some element of risk. There was no 100% right solution. And this comes down to, you know, business is chaos. Combat is chaos. Uh, every day that we come in, something new pops up. There's battles to be fought. Oh, it, it's... It, it, whether it's a uh, machine breaking down or... Uh, a vendor bringing some uh, parts into us, and, and he has a machine breaking down, uh, which we get a phone call saying, hey, you know, we're going to miss your schedule. To uh, a water line breaking in the floor and, uh, you know, having to, to deal with that. Giant rainstorm. <clears throat> we find out all, all, where all the leaks are in our roof, and some of them are coming down right on top of, uh, you know, a million dollar machine. A million dollar machines. <laughs> I mean, you you never know what's going on. You you come in with this, uh, you know. Uh, I I I live by to do lists. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I have a list of things I want to do each day. <clears throat> and uh, most of the time, uh, I'll get some of them done. Sometimes all of them. But there's days when uh, nothing on that list gets done because something has come up at work. There are brush fires. <sighs> You know, every day I hear you sigh, Danny. I know you deal with it. Uh, well, when that list, you, you write, because I have a list too. And when you when I go home for the day and, and I see nothing crossed out, it, it is a very disheartening feeling. Oh, terrible, terrible feeling. So there's chaos. Uh, you know, it, it's it's not. I'm going to throw your phone out the window. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I still got to run the business. Um I can't let these pro these podcasts prioritize uh, over uh, getting the uh, the thing that uh, that we do <laughs> for real uh, at this place. Um, a lot of that uh, involves making uh, decisions in, in the midst of that contest. Now, granted, it's not these uh, we're not making life or death decisions here, but uh, they're decisions nonetheless, and uh, they're important because a lot of people's uh, uh, futures, you know. Their their mortgage payment and their their uh, uh, rent uh, and everything depends on what what we do here to keep things uh, going, keep the lights on, and keep keep this business running. So, uh, you know, a lot of those decisions that you that come up in the midst of this chaos, those are hard decisions, and uh, they're tough to make even with the leisure of time and and uh, and no chaos. So we're going to talk about. Uh, 
one of those hard decisions. And, uh, you know, every once in a while you get an employee. Uh, and, again, one of the things that, that uh, we learned uh, was, you know, no, you know there, there's no bad teams. There's only bad leaders. Is that sometimes we had people uh, doing jobs that we thought they were underperforming or that they were a bad person, if you will, a bad employee. And, and really what it came down to was getting that person uh, into a slotted into a better position. Uh, you know, some people are uh, have light touch. Some people have a heavy touch. That's just something that's kind of hardwired into some people. And uh, if we have a hard uh, person with a hard touch doing a light touch job, uh, that's my fault for not uh, recognizing that. Uh, you know, if we put that person into a in the position where they were they had to do heavy work, then they they did just fine. And we found that out to be true uh, time and time again that it was a matter of of uh, me not being able to understand where that person was best suited because uh, we, we were lucky. We had we had a bunch of good people. It was just a matter of uh, uh, learning uh, what their skills were, uh, where they were best applied. And so, again, you know, that cross-training, that, that also uh, allowed us to to see firsthand, you know, oh, that person really excels over there and they, and they, they don't do as well uh, over there. You know, we still need them to be able to do it in a pinch. But uh, we, we were able to see where, where people uh, flourished and, and where, they, where they struggled. But, you know, every once in a while, uh, you know, you get a bad apple. And uh, we're fortunate in, in 30 years we've only had two or three bad apples. But there was one that uh, ended up being a, a bad apple. And uh, we're going to call him uh, Juan. And... Uh, you know, a bad apple can spoil the barrel real, real fast. And uh, one of the things that, that I did know from reading other business books and that over the years, uh, trying to educate myself, was uh, you, you really have to get rid of the bad apples uh, as quickly as possible because they can, they can cause a lot of turmoil out in the shop. And, you know, it, it really wasn't, uh, you know, the, this guy Juan was, was actually, uh, we thought, a pretty good performer. He was always... Uh, you know, jumping in the front of the line to volunteer to do stuff and things like that. So, you know, we, we thought, well, he's a pretty good guy. But what we noticed was uh, there was a lot of stuff that was happening out in the shop, and it was causing, you know, people to feel uncomfortable. And, and there was little things like, uh, uh, you know, my coffee cup fell off the edge of my bench, and, and I didn't think I had it that close to the edge. And... Uh, I opened the door and the, and the broom fell and hit me. Uh, uh, there was even one time where you'd open the bathroom door and somebody had to put a cup of water, you know, at the top of the door. So when you open the door, you get a cup of water splashed on your face, which is, it's funny if you're in a college dorm, but, yeah. you know, we're in a business. Not funny. We don't funny. have time for that. Not funny. And, you know, we started to see this stuff. And, you know, again, nobody wants to be a tattletale. Uh, we knew uh, people out there had a good idea of who it was that was doing it, but uh, you know they they know that uh, if they were to tell us something that could cost someone else their job, there could be some ramifications to that. And then this guy was not a uh, he wasn't overly aggressive or hostile, but he was a great big hulking guy, and uh, was a little intimidating uh, to a lot of people, and. So they were reluctant. You know, we we knew something was going on. We, we well, no, I don't know. I, I don't know. His numbers were, were really good. So yeah, and, and so we were like, wow, that's what's going on here. So finally, 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 we 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 got someone who who really uh, was forthright and said, look, you know, this guy's doing this, and it's causing all kinds of problems. And he makes fun of people, and he and he says things when they walk away that you know, you know about someone's weight or someone's walk or someone being old or whatever and on top of these things trying to be a, a, a snide or or make a, a funny comment and they weren't funny they were actually uh nasty little snippets and stuff that he would do and in addition to you know i guess just uh messing with people all the time and and, and at, at a point uh we noticed that it, it was causing turmoil between 
other employees because you know people assume that that Bob did this to me and when when uh, Juan was actually the guy doing it and so we finally got to the bottom of it and uh, you know but me I was sitting here going dang the guy's got good numbers and all this and that and he's really he's working hard and he seems to to do the right thing but you know what can we put up with and we, you know, I, I happened to be away. It, this got, you know, it got pretty bad. It, it, and and I happened to be away. I was up at what they call the SHOT Show, which is a big show in our industry. And, and uh, uh, Larry and Rick were also up there with me. And, and we had some downtime, so we were sitting around talking. I was telling them about this guy, Juan, and, and that. And they, they had heard uh, me talk about him uh, several times in the past. So they kind of knew there was something going on. And uh, they said, look, you know, you, you have to deal with this. It's got to be taken care of. And uh, that, that's the bottom line. You, you can't let this happen. You can't let someone uh, disrupt the rest of that team. Uh, all, all the things that you've done and put into place to, to, to build cohesiveness and, and teamwork and all that. And now you've got a guy in there who's doing every single day something that's, that's undoing all of that work. And so, you know, we're, we're up uh, at this show. And uh, I was like, wow. So I've got to do this, and uh, it, you know, now's the time. Uh, and and I'm you know several hundred miles away, so I call down to Danny, and uh, because Rick and, and and Larry said, well, you know what, let's give Danny this this job. Let's uh, let's put him uh, in a a leadership position and give him a learning experience here to uh, bring this guy in and, and tell him that you know what, it's over. We're letting you go. So I called Danny uh, from the show, and I said, Danny, you gotta, you got to fire Juan and, uh, you know, take care of that. So uh, lo and behold, uh, Danny uh, brought uh, Juan in, told him that was his last day. We always do everything on a Friday. That's something that we also learned uh, in the past. And dealing with a lot of uh, uh, security stuff and everything over the years, uh, you know, one of the things you want to do if you have to let somebody go is you let them go uh, at the end of the day on Friday which gives them uh, a weekend to kind of decompress. Uh, you don't want to let somebody go uh, on a Monday or Tuesday when all of a sudden they're sitting around on a Wednesday or Thursday going, you know, my entire life is disrupted. Uh, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going back there and, and I'm going to take a gun and, and shoot that son of a gun that fired me. Uh, there's a lot less of that type of uh, reaction or knee-jerk reaction when you uh, let somebody go on a Friday at the end of the of the day because their routine is that they already have two days to uh, have off. So it's a normal weekend. Uh, the only thing that's changed is they're not going to be coming back on Monday. And again, you do it at the end of the day, uh, right at the end, so that uh, they don't have to go back out into the uh, uh, workforce uh, and be humiliated or feel that they're... Uh, that they uh, uh, are embarrassed by what what has just happened to them, so you do it right right when they're punching out. Basically, you bring them in the office and have that talk with them. And uh, <clears throat> you know, we expected uh, again, you know, that there might be a little backlash or something like that, but there wasn't. And Danny, he he took it pretty much like a man. Uh, you know, there was no like, "Why are you doing this?" or anything like that, was there? Um, there was a. A little bit, yeah. Actually, but you know, again, and, and Leif and Jocko talked about happy. this. He wasn't happy. Well, yeah, and no one's happy. Which, understandable. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, most people know when it's coming. Uh, Leif and Jocko talk about that uh, on their podcast and in the book. You know, uh, most people that end up being discharged from a company, uh, they know uh, that they weren't performing or that they were doing something wrong. No, nobody. You know if you're messing around with people, and uh, you got to expect that uh, at some point there's going to be a repercussion. So, you know, and most people that do those kinds of things that that, that when the cops come knocking on the door, you're running out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're not like, why are you here? Uh, you know that he did something bad. So, anyway, I gave that job to Danny, and and he he discharged it, and uh, you know, uh, you know. Again, back to the bad apple thing and making these uh, dis this decisive decisions. I let that go for a long, long time. Uh, I kind of knew, uh, we we really kind of knew in our in our hearts that this was the guy that was doing this. But we, you know, me uh, being the last uh, word on who was going to get 
uh, hired or fired. Uh, I kind of hung on to him for a little bit too long. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about laziness or, or perform, poor performance or anything uh, because those things could be fixed. But when you've got a really true bad apple, you need to move quickly uh, and decisively. Uh, and what that does is it sets a standard for what will be, uh, you know, tolerated at, at your business or, you know, by you as a manager. And, and, and in addition to that, it'll, it'll show how far you're willing to go to protect the rest of your employees. You let a quote unquote good employee go who is doing bad things uh, because those bad things were uh, affecting the other employees. We didn't let him go because he was uh, uh, making bad parts or not making enough parts. So, you know, that's a, that's a decisive uh, uh, decision that had to be made. Uh, and uh, we made it on the behalf of the other employees. And again, that sets a standard for them that, you know what, we're, we're protecting you. We're not going to allow somebody to, to, to bring those kind of things to, to bear on you. So on to the final chapter that I'm going to talk about. Um, discipline equals freedom. Uh, and this one is uh, a chapter by uh, Jocko, I believe. And uh, what we had uh, going on that, that uh, it relates to this chapter is a leader must be close with subordinates, but not too close. This is Jocko talking. The best leaders understand the motivations of their team members and know their people, their lives, and their families. But a leader must never grow so close to subordinates that one member of the team becomes more important than any other or more important than the mission itself. Leaders must never get so close that the team forgets who is in charge. Now, they go on. uh, We had an employee. His name was Andy. And uh, actually, the guy that's in this chapter by uh, Jocko is also named Andy. Yeah, but Andy was the, uh, the team leader in this case. And uh, it says, yeah, he's a, an old friend of Andy's, answered the CFO, and a very good friend that has stuck with him through thick and thin. Okay, I replied, understanding what was being implied. Andy was taking care of his friend. Now, if you make me uh, the guy taking care of Andy, uh, that's kind of what was going on. Uh, you know, Andy was, uh, was a good guy and, uh, he was a guy, I guess at times you could say you just felt a little sorry for, I know he'd had a, uh, never had a lot of breaks in his life and all that. And, uh, we're, we're trying to be compassionate and, and see through, uh, some of those things. Uh, but he was a, a real underperformer and, uh, no matter what we did, uh, we couldn't get him. I mean, we tried. Uh, Danny, how many years did we keep him on past when we should have let him go? Three or four years? Yeah, it's, it's a couple. I mean, it, it, it was, you know, I feel kind of dumb again, you know, admitting this to you. Oh, we, got, we got too close. Yeah. Uh, he was a likable guy. He was a friendly guy. And uh, we just kept, we kept making excuses on our end. Uh, you know, maybe you could get him to do this. Maybe it's because of that. And, uh then we started to notice a pattern of events when uh, whenever we would bring him in and have a, a talk with him, you know, like, Andy, you got to you've got to tighten you up on on this stuff because, uh, you know, you're you're slacking off or we see you, you know, messing around or whatever. Uh, lo and behold, uh, next day he wouldn't come to work or we would notice that when there was a real pressing issue, uh, something that we needed all hands uh, on deck, uh, Andy wouldn't show up. And then we started to look at it and said, you know what? We got, we got a little passive aggressive going on here. Uh, he's never confrontational. But then when he gets a moment to kind of, in his mind or in his, his view, hold us over the barrel, uh, he takes it. And it was a, an effort, I think, on his part to show us, uh, quote unquote, how important he was to, to us. And at the same time, uh, we were looking at it going, you know what? This guy's really. He, he's he's willing to do this to us to to get back at us for us trying to help him be a better employee and, and honest my goal with everybody is really to help him be a better person because if i can help somebody to be a better person i've got a better employee so you know we're trying to teach this guy you know life skills things that he could uh, take away and, and use personally and all that and uh danny i don't know how many conversations you and i had it seemed like every week we were talking about 
Yeah. What, what can we do with Andy? But, you know, we, I never uh, pulled that trigger to, uh, to actually terminate him uh, because I was too close to it. I felt sorry for him. I, I thought he was a, a, a good guy and we could, we could get him back on track. And uh, we realized at one point, uh, finally, that uh, he was never going to get back on track. That was the way he was. He was locked in. And so uh, we, we had to make a, a hard decision with him. And uh, again, we were, we were guilty of some of the things that Leif and, and Jocko had talked about also was, you know, we said, well, we're going to do this and we're going to have this and this guy's not doing this right. And we're going to make sure that he understands exactly what we, you know, need and et cetera, et cetera. And then we'd bring him in. And, and it's funny because I heard Leif actually uh, talked about it and it was almost the exact same conversation. Well, we think you're doing OK, but we know you could improve a little bit in this area and uh you know we should uh you know we'd like you to be able to think about what you're doing a little more and all of a sudden what we we thought was going to be our hard conversation ended up this all soft and fuzzy feeling and and we never got the results we wanted so uh, again uh Leif and uh, had had uh, mentioned you know write those things down and then when that person comes in uh you've got it written down and you you read what you've written down so that there isn't this uh softening up of your attitude because you know most people don't want to be confrontational, and most people don't want to make someone else feel bad. And again, uh, you know, I was guilty of that. And so what we did was we actually, we had a list, you know, these are the things, and this is why you're being fired. And, and finally, we were able to stick to our guns and, and let Andy go. And uh, lo and behold, we got a new guy to replace him right away. And uh, he, he basically tripled or quadrupled the, the output that Andy was able to to do uh, on his best days so uh, it worked out better for us in the end so anyway uh, you know the things that I've learned from uh, Jocko and Leif's book uh, are things that uh, we've applied directly to our business and uh, I gotta say hey man uh, good on you guys because if you've helped us as as much uh, if you've helped other people as much as you've helped us uh, you've done a huge huge amount of work uh, for good uh, in the, in uh, a lot of people's lives so uh, that's it for now Danny and uh, again I want to thank Leif and Jocko for making such a, a great book I want to thank all the seals that, that have helped me in my career on the way and I want to especially thank Larry and Rick for being our mentor for three or four years and getting us back on track we're still not perfect. We're still a work in progress, but we're a lot better off than we were when we started. That wraps up uh, episode number five. So uh, uh, once again, I just want to say, uh, you know, if you like us, support the, the podcast by subscribing. Uh, you know, you can support us by buying buying stuff off the, the podcast website at emersonpodcast.com. Uh, we've got books and uh, we've got uh, uh, gear and shirts and uh uh, glasses, uh, protective glasses, actually sunglasses, and a whole bunch of stuff like that. So, uh, you know, if you like us, uh, leave a review on iTunes, uh, like us on Facebook, you know, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, you, you can find our podcasts uh, listed, I think, uh, Danny, if I'm, if I'm correct, uh, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and also you can find us on YouTube. Just subscribe to uh, uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, just search out uh, the er- Ernest Emerson podcast. And, you know, and, and as always, you can, you can find all of uh, the podcasts uh, on our site, uh, emersonpodcast.com. Ernestemersonpodcast.com. Uh, I need to thank our sponsors, uh, the Order of the Black Shamrock. Uh, you find out about them over at the order of the black um, and, and the hoist Gracie Jiu Jitsu South Bay. Uh, they can be found at hoist Gracie South And once again, uh, we all need uh, to thank uh, all the men and women on the front lines, wherever that may be, who are the warriors and protectors for all of the rest of us. May God bless and protect our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coasties, and all those who wear the badge or are the first responders. Without your bravery and sacrifice, we would, with certainty, have never become the greatest nation in the history of mankind. And none of us would be able to sleep soundly in our beds at night. That's it. 
See you all, folks. Thank you very much. Danny? Signing out.